so. So um, it's my huge honor to introduce the last speaker for tonight, and I like to say the best comes last, but of course we always have rock star speakers, you, it's your opinion. So Sebastian Ebert studied computer science in a cozy town called Schmalkalden. <laughs> Schmalkalden. So he wrote his thesis on co the combination of knowledge-based um, systems and handwriting recognition at the German Research Center of Artificial Intelligence in Kaiserslautern. And then he um, also did his master there and came to LMU to work with Professor Heinrich Schütze in computational linguistics. And he will talk about language modeling and how he used deep learning methods to accelerate this. So thank you very much and um, hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you, David. And uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I really feel like a rock star with this microphone here. It feels pretty cool. So um, I'm Sebastian, and I'm from the Computer Linguistic Institute of the LMU. And today, I try to give you a small overview of what cool applications we have in the field of natural language processing. And I will show a little bit of what I actually deal with every day. So the first thing I want to start with is what actually is NLP, NLP like natural language processing, what is that? Basically it's everything that makes, um, makes computers deal with speech, with text, it allows us to recognize speech, it allows us to generate, generate speech, and it's basically something that everybody of you is, is, a, is an expert in, language. And I show you some examples of uh, useful applications of that, and probably all of you know these and, and I want to introduce some problems they still face nowadays. So the first example is on search engines. I took the example of Bing and I asked Bing who the president of Germany was and it gave me the correct answer by saying it is Johannes, uh, Joachim Gauck, Johannes, Joachim Gauck and I don't even have to scroll through all the result pages and tens of pages or whatever. I just have a look at the first page and it directly shows me the answer already there. And you can, can do something even fancier. You can ask, um, who is he married to? So instead of asking, who is jo uh, Joachim Gauck married to, you can refer to he, um, and Bing gets um, basically all the queries you, had, uh, you, answered, uh, you entered before and finds out that he must refer to Joachim Gauck. And this is actually pretty cool. So this is a typical application of which we deal with in NLP. And you can also ask um, how old his wife might be, and Bing is pretty humorous, and it's a, it must be very, very old. <laughs> <laughs> a second pretty cool example, uh, I guess many of you already know, is Siri, or the Microsoft pendant is Cortana. It's basically a personal <coughs> assistant. You give it commands, like you, you simply push this button on the left, you say some message like, um, tell Stephanie I'll be right there, and it translates that command into something useful. For example, it recognizes that tell means you want to send a message. So it creates a new message, and it recognizes that Stephanie is, is a person, and this person is someone you must know because you refer to it by name. So it searches in your phone book, and it finds uh, uh, Stephanie there, and then Siri um, finds uh, finds the text in your message and already puts the text in into this message and you just have to send it. Pretty cool. Cortana basically works the same. You push the button and you can ask a question like who won the Mets game? Mets is a New York baseball club and it directly shows you the, the result of the last Mets game. So this seems pretty cool. But actually this is a, is a very difficult application if you think about it. Um, what, it needs to be, what needs to be done in the background is it needs to get your audio signal and trans, uh, transfers that audio signal into text and then analyzes the text. And you can imagine if you do a mistake in the first step, like you, you don't recognize Stephanie, but uh, for example Sylvie or whatever, um, then this error propagates to the further step. So this is a very, very complicated application. And to show you that this is very complicated, there are some, of course, some, some pretty big fails. Here the user said, Siri, you, you need to do a better job in understanding me. And Siri, okay, noted. And then the guy says, yeah, sure, make a note of that. And then Siri creates a note with of that. <laughs> Not very helpful, right? So what, what is kind of missing here is, uh, Siri does not really uh, recognize emotions, or in this case, sarcasm is very hard to detect. <laughs> 
The second example is the guy says, Siri, I'm bleeding really bad. Can you please call me an ambulance? And Siri says, OK, from now on, I will call you an ambulance. <laughs> so you see. <laughs> You see, language is, is very ambiguous, so it's not really clear what a certain thing means. So for us, everybody directly understands the sentence, but it's very difficult for a computer to disambiguate these different meanings. And the last fail I brought you is where the user says, my favorite thing is a mango, and, and Siri doesn't know what to do with it, so just, oh, and then the user says, what do you think my favorite food is? And every one of us knows, you just told me, why can't you just say mango? Uh, but Siri doesn't know, because it does not have this discourse information, so basically the path through all our messages or all our commands we had before. This is lacking here. A third application, probably every one of you have used already, is machine translation. I, choose, uh, I chose Google Translate here, and I tried some simple sentences, and it worked very well. So unfortunately, I had to choose German and English. I hope every one of you knows at least one of these. Um, and the first translation is, is like the perfect translation. I couldn't do it better, um, even though I'm not a native speaker. And it also works with idioms, which is usually very difficult, because idioms are not translated word by word, but have a certain meaning, and you want to tr uh, translate this certain meaning into the other language. And this, by the way, also works the other way around, from English to, uh, to German. Where it fails is, of course, by the, at the Dudelsack Pfeifenmachergesellenprüfung. Um, this is a very long German compound, and it really has a problem finding that it, actually the important thing here is the exam and not the person. Um, so these German compounds are still some difficulty for translation system. Um, a, different, uh, a different problem with that is um, the sentence hast du den Boden sauber gemacht, which would be translated to did you clean the floor, is being translated into something very German-like. It's basically just word by word translation. And did you do the floor clean is what a beginner in English would probably form as a translation. And the last uh, complicated thing here is this Abnehmen, which we see here, is a separable verb in German. And uh, Google Translate in inputs an unnecessary preposition at the end. So you see, it's still a very difficult problem. And a friend of mine just recently told me that it becomes even, even worse if you have very formal German text. Um, so yesterday I was, uh, I was reading, very late, I was reading a rent contract. And would, I would be happy to have some translation from for like a law language into standard German language. But unfortunately, that is not, that is still future. Um, yeah. <laughs> So the last thing on my list is IBM Watson. IBM Watson is a very cool artificial intelligence system that combines many different things from natural language processing, like starting from question answering. You can ask a question and it will give you the answer. And it incorporates something we call named entity recognition. That means it, out of text, it recognizes what are the companies he refers to, what are the names, what are locations, and so on. This is a very difficult, difficult task on its own. And it combines all that with world knowledge. So it knows, for example, that Barack Obama is the president of the United States once it has recognized that Barack Obama is a person. And IBM said, sent this system to participate in a Jeopardy task. And Jeopardy works the following. You get a, basically an answer to a question. You see that answer. And your task is to come up with the, the question that could raise this answer. Uh, so it's basically a reverse question answering system. And it was in 2011 when um, IBM Watson, this system here in the middle, this is the final picture when it won, it basically beat, uh, it bet all the two, the, the two best Jeopardy players so far. So there was a major breakthrough in natural language processing as well as in artificial intelligence in general. 
the second part of my talk, I'm going to talk about something that we call sentiment analysis. This is, this, the, that is the topic I deal with every day and have been dealing with for the last couple of months or even years. Um, there are different names out there for sentiment analysis, could be opinion mining, um, sentiment mining and so on, but it basically all means the same. We want to find out what the sentiment of some pieces of text is. And sentiment is the type of emotion this text conveys. And in our particular examples, we, we will focus just on polarity. And polarity, we mean, is this piece of text positive? Is it negative? Is it neutral? How, and some other people might even wonder how positive and negative it is. OK, so first of all, I will show you some, some introductory examples how, um, why, why that would be useful. How, um, we already saw something from Stefan here. And, and then I will tell you what I work on and show how deep learning comes into that. So consider this restaurant review. We already um, saw, you can do that with hotels, and I'm very uh, happy that he did not talk about restaurants. Um, so what we see here is just one review from Yelp. This is, um, you see the person who wrote this review, the overall score the person gave to this, uh, to this restaurant. It's a Korean place in Los Altos. And it wrote, uh, the, the reviewer also wrote some text to it. And if we know that all restaurants have something in common, we can come up with categories that would describe a restaurant pretty well, like interior, or how is the food in the restaurant, how is the staff, and so on. And if we then go, to, go through the text, we can find evidence for that, but, uh, for particular um, attributes or properties of that restaurant. For example, the blue things here um, clearly indicate uh, that the interior is pretty good. So we are lucky because already interior is here and is also the name of the class, so this is pretty simple. And we can just put all these attributes there and we say, okay, this must be positive category. Then we can go on further in the text and we find that the, the service is attentive, fast, and friendly, and service is just a different word for staff. So we put that to the staff category and everything is, is positive as well. And last but not least, we find that the food is pretty good and we put food into um, the category as well and give it also a positive score. The overall score is just taken from the review itself. This is very simple. And um, yeah, here we just have the problem that the location, for example, is not filled. And this is just one review. So if you consider um, 100 reviews for, for, the simple, for the single restaurant, you can imagine that if you aggregate all these, um, all these features, all the adjectives uh, and all the ratings, you can come up with a pretty good um, measure and can say that, for example, if 100 people reviewed and 80% were very happy with the stuff, so you have like a four out of five rating for the stuff, um, which can give you a very nice overview of the restaurant. And that, um, actually, I find that, as a private person, I find that very interesting because um, uh, at the TIS Institute where I live, we, where I live, yeah, sometimes I, feel, <laughs> I really feel like it. <laughs> uh, where I work, uh, I organize a PhD dinner every Wednesday and we are always looking for new restaurants we haven't checked out before. And this is pretty helpful in that, in that regard. So uh, I make heavy use of that. But something that is, uh, you can also do with, with emotions and sentiment analysis is you can use Twitter data to get some basic feedback in, the ter in terms of positivity or negativity um, or from the Twitter users. So consider the first row. This is basically the overall positivity score um, over a course of two months or one, one month period. And within that one month period, Data is taken from, from the US. There was the day after election, and there was a Thanksgiving. So basically, people became more positive on or after the day of election, and became more positive on um, Thanksgiving. I think that makes sense, because everybody's so excited to see his family and get some turkey and uh, eat a lot. And, and then researchers uh, around Bonn et al. came up with a more fine-grained um, analysis, and they uh, came up with six different uh, measures you could uh, you could search for, and they found, for example, that people became more happy around the election day, or very very happy around Thanksgiving, and people also became um, very nervous uh, on the day before the election. So there is clearly some evidence that um, this data is um, can be used for um, tracking public emotions, and. 
uh, a very nice commercial application for that is predicting the stock market. So researchers found that if you, if you take this calm level we saw before, this was just one of the emotions, if you take that calm score and uh, correlate it with some Dow Jones index, we see in the shaded areas here, we see that there is a very high correlation between um, the opinion, uh, so the, the sentiment on this calm level and the Dow Jones level. So if we could all do that, we're going to be rich. <laughs> A third application uh, is again Twitter. And um, the O'Connor et al, what they did over a course of two years, they, they kind of got the data together from uh, first Twitter and then second from something called Gallup poll. This is where, uh, where people in the States get calls and are ask questions about how confident are they um, about their future and the, about their current situation. And you clearly see that the blue line, which is the sentiment you extract from Twitter, and the Gallup line here, the, 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 blue li the black line, the, there is a very high correlation, it's even 0.8, it's very high correlated. And what that basically means is you could, uh, you could leave out all these Gallup polls. You get this Twitter data for free, you don't have to do anything, you just take it and put it in bags and uh, you can save tons of money without, you don't need to do this Gallup anymore. The last application for sentiment analysis is again a private one. Um, consider movie reviews. This is uh, movie reviews for the pretty recent movie Ex Machina and people wrote uh, for example, weak and ridiculous. Definitely a negative thing, right? Too slow, too new, interesting. So, so uh, first of all, Ava is absolutely stunning as a positive review. And my work is basically um, dealing with these kinds of things. I want to classify this given text into positive, negative, or neutral. There's nothing else. And a pretty basic approach, uh, um, simple and forward approach is to just take a word list of positive and negative words. And then we see weak and ridiculous negative words, so two negative words, the whole thing must be negative. And then we have one negative and one positive thing. This thing is like neutral, so, so one, one good, one bad. And then the last one is absolutely stunning. Stunning is the only word I have in my workbook and then um, this must uh, definitely be positive. So that's pretty easy, right? If only people were so easy. So we have to deal with many different things, uh, very simple things you might, you might think. For example, misspelling. Uh, weird is a very good example. People tend to misspell that word. Um, also negation is a very difficult thing for a machine because uh, first you have to know what in, in your sentence is actually negated. Uh, does not here belong to really or does not belong to good? And then even if you could find that out, you don't, you, you, you're likely to do the mistake to think that not good is the same as bad, but actually that's not true. So this is very difficult. And then you have to deal with things like domain dependency. If a friend of yours comes out of a bookstore and says, yeah, I bought this new book, I just read it yesterday evening, I couldn't stop, go read this book. This is positive for the book, right? If the, if you're the same friend of yours gets out of the movies, just saw a movie, and tells you, go read a book. That's definitely something negative, right? So we have a very critical domain dependency here. And the last but not least, Twitter. <laughs> yeah, people come up with all weird abbreviations. Um, I don't know what that means, but it has some meaning apparently. People uh, start abbreviating, people uh, don't use real grammar anymore. Uh, Put in intentional misspelling, I, I'm sure that means something else, but S-U-X. And we have these nice elongated words here, um, like cool with 25 O's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, so these are the most popular problems, but even if you have a clear text, a, a very clean text, and everything is properly spelled and the grammar is nice, you, you have to deal with different problems. For example, consider just the word, the single word hard. What do you think, how many different senses or meanings does the word hard have? You, you might start with, okay, um, it could mean something difficult, like a hard exam, or it could mean something like intense, right? So I work hard, that means something, I work very intense. 
So we did this analysis on a, on a pretty big corpus and we found 10 different meanings of sense. Starting from firm, when something is a hard floor or a hard table, going to difficult, intense, or hard rock type music, or even phrases someone might not think about in the first place, like hard disk. I don't want to have hard disk to be negative meaning because it's hard. <laughs> so all of these 10 different meanings have one, one polarity label attached. And we need to find out of the context, what is the actual sense we have to deal with here. So now, he has talked a lot about NLP, where's the cool deep learning stuff. Um, here's what we want. We have such a sentence. And what we want is we want to have a machine learning or a cool deep learning model that gives us the polarity of that sentence, right? So what it needs to have is it needs to be context dependent so that we find out what is this, uh, the the meaning of hard in this specific context, or what does absolutely do with stunning here. The second thing is, um, sentences are usually of different types of length, so we need something that is length independent. And the last thing is, we want something that focuses just on the very important things for polarity classification. And in polarity, usually it's the case that you have a long sentence and there is just one or two things that, are very, uh, that actually have an influence on polarity of the whole thing. And some of you hopefully have, has, have guessed already that we can use CNNs for that. So just to give you a, call, uh, a short wrap up, We've seen like how a cool CNN works already. So just imagine this is the, the poster of the X Machina again. We have a 2D input here, and then the red thing is our filter. And we, we slide that filter over our input, and at every position we do this convolution step and get one value out of it. So here I have three positions, so I get three values out of it. And then in order to find different patterns, I have multiple of these convolution filters. So here I have three, so one might find that stunning is very good, one might find that there is a knot, and so on. And then of all these three filters, we get just the maximum value out of it. This is called max pooling. We just get the maximum value out of it and get three values as a result. And finally, there comes this uh, fully connected hidden layer, um, and this one classifies the whole thing into positive and negative. So, so far, it's a pretty cool idea, but w what do we do with the text? So we saw that it works perfectly well for images, but what, what should we do here? How should we represent the word? Uh, one idea is, okay, I have a, rep a, a picture representation of Ava, so this is the actress of Ava, so I put, it, put her in there. So, but what do I do with the word stunning? How can I put this word stunning into my 2D, two-dimensional input? There's just no solution for that, right? So what we want is, we want to have something where we can put the words in here and then slide the filter over it and get all the important sentiment information out of it. And in order to get that, we have to have some one-dimensional representation for every single word so that we can plug it together into some 2D input. And we do that with so-called word representations or sometimes referred to as word embeddings because we embed our words into some latent space. And uh, in the next few slides, I'm gonna show you how that is done and what, why that is so amazing. So it was in 2013 when Mikolov et al. proposed this a very simple model to get from a single word to a word representation. This is a very simple uh, one hidden layer neural network. No, no magic in here. What it does is, it takes one word, for example, Eva, and puts it in here. And then this projection layer is used to transfer this word into this 1D vector we saw before. In the beginning, all our words have a randomly initialized vector. Nothing, still no magic here. And then we want to have this one dimensional vector representation. We want to predict all the neighboring words, in that case, it's of all, which we of all and is absolutely. That's the whole model. So we take a word, convert it into this vector, and want to predict all the neighboring words. And that is done for all words in our input. So we start with first at this position, then we put off at this position, all, and so on, over, over a huge corpus of text. 
And if we have billions of, of uh, words in our corpus, we learn some reasonably good, uh, no, actually very amazingly good um, word representations um, by this very simple model. And all of that comes at no cost because we don't need any label data. The only thing is we need text and we have a bunch of that. And the results are pretty amazing. So what you see here is a 2D protection of this, uh, I think it's 100 dimensional vectors into 2D. And you see that you have some clusters here, clustering of words there. And if you take a closer look, for example, this cluster on top of here is all the words that are um, some country, some city, a state in the, uni uh, in the US, and so on. Um, and the cluster next to it is a, is a clustering of all month's names. So you see there must be some latent structure in this 100 dimensional space. And you can do such cool things. You can have a look at the three tenses of a verb and you will see that this um, relation, this regularity, the, this relation between the three uh, bet between the three tenses is the same for all my verbs. So there's clearly some syntactically regularity going on here. But not only uh, syntactical irregularity, but also semantic irregularity. So for example, the vector that goes from man to woman is roughly the same as the vector that goes from the word uncle to the, uh, to the word aunt, or from king to queen. So it's basically like a um, make it female vector. And this clearly shows some, some semantic um, structure in there. And if you take that, you can do some cool vector algebra. So just imagine you take the vector from king to kings and put it on top of queen. Then you will get queens, right? Does it make sense? So, <laughs> so what you can do is you get the vector that um, combines big and bigger, put it on cold, and what do you think you get? You get colder. I mean, for us it's very simple, right? But this is a machine, come on. <laughs> so you can ask, like, if Paris is to France, what is the same for Italy? Rome. And it will give you Rome. If Windows is for Microsoft, what is Google? <laughs> I heard it, Android, yeah, very good. And now the best one is, if sushi is to Japan, what do you think is the most important food in Germany? <laughs> Beer? Beer is pretty good, yeah. Sorry, what? Brezel? It's not Brezel, it's a Bratwurst. <laughs> and you can use these vector representations also for machine translation. That is pretty awesome. One for all. One to rule them all. So people um, train these word representations on English and on Spanish. And then, as you see, there's basically um, the same distribution of these words hidden in both languages, right? So, doesn't that mean that if we learn some linear transformation from cat to gato, from pig to cerdo, I hope I don't insult any Spanish-speaking people here, um, you can train a linear transformation, and then if you have a new word like dog, and you don't know this translation for dog, you put this linear transformation on it, and take the closest word to that endpoint. And that indeed is paddle, it's dog. So this is very, very useful for machine translation as well. And again, at no cost. So now we have something we can plug into our CNN. We have a nice 1D structure for every word. And we can slide our filter and get the final polarity classification out of it. And we did that uh, in some public available data set. And we are close to state of the art. So for example, the first, the first system is an ensemble system of four or five different machine learning systems. The second one also uses CNNs because CNNs tend to become very, very popular in NLP nowadays. Um, but they used lots, uh, tons, tons of additional training data where they had created labels for. And our CNN is very, very close to that. And let's have a look at some positive classifications. Um, can't wait to see the iPad HD. This is clearly positive, and our, our network also thinks this, this is positive. Um, then, um, blah, 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 are you coming to the fair on Sunday? There's no sentiment given here, and our network recognizes that. Um, let's look at some failures. failures. Um, the Spurs may have won the battle, but not the war. Uh, it's labeled as positive. Our ne network thinks it's negative. 
um, basically the, the writer would imply that you should not give up. There's still hope that, the, um, that your team has won. But actually it's a negative thing, right? Because our team lost. Um, okay, the second one is golf tomorrow, meet at a forum at 2 p.m. It's labeled as neutral. Our, our network is apparently a golf, uh, golf addicted network and it thinks that it's a very cool thing to do it tomorrow. And the last thing contains many words that our network probably has never seen before, like Ren or Owain, Fluff. So this is labeled as positive, our network just said it's negative uh, and neutral. So you see there's still lots of um, potential upwards. <clears throat> so finally a small conclusion, NLP is definitely cool. So <laughs> and I think you should all come to our institute and talk to us and uh, get some get some cool PhD positions and stuff. Um, we have lots of unsolved problems and but we are working on it. Deep learning has uh, uh, has been introduced in many of the deep, uh, of the NLP tasks. Like it used to become very very important and very successful in speech recognition, for example. I think it was in 2007 or so. And it is used in machine translation. Not only the way I showed you, but there are different ways to to incorporate that for machine translation. And this type of representation learning, how to come from a word to a meaningful vector, became a new research field on its own. So they have an own conference since 2011, I think. So for sentiment analysis, um, we have private as well as commercial applications. If a company, for example, wants to, wants to know what do people think about my product, what do they like about it, what don't they like about it, then um, this is very helpful for, um, for companies. It's still challenging because of things like I showed you with the heart and the, the Twitter normalization problem. And I showed you that CNNs can be used for text and in more particular it can be used for um, sentiment classification. So in general what we do at, at CIS, uh, so CIS is the institute, just to let you know again, we have a, first of all a pretty cool location, it's next to the English Garden, very close to the Chinese Tower for those of you who like beer. We open the window and hear Bavarian music. Um, <laughs> So we do, we do all these kinds of cool things. I didn't have the time to, to tell you about them all. We, we, we do some language modeling. We do knowledge-based systems. We do this cool machine translation and more. And I hope um, you're also ex as much excited as I am. And uh, I hope you um, have some cool questions for me. Talk, and sad that you cannot talk about the cool stuff you're doing, but maybe some questions of you can get some information out. I get the feeling that sentiment analysis of subject of thing, for example, one sentence might appear positive to one person, but for others might be negative. So yes. how do you, for that, because you can only have branches. So yeah, this is indeed a very difficult problem because um, if you, for example, go to different cultures, like in, in, in China, something might be positive, whereas in an Arabic country it might be negative. Yeah. This is a very difficult problem, but we kind of don't deal with that uh, because we just um, choose text input from a very specific domain. So for example, we filter for English. So there we hope we don't have that problem, but this, this is indeed a problem. And it might even, if you think about it, it might even make a difference from you to your neighbor. Yeah, exactly. So how do you account for the different kinds of sequence? For the different, yeah, that is a very good question. Um, can I make that faster here? So the different length of sequences is not dealt at that level. So basically you slide the window as long as your sentence is, right? So you get a different length uh, convolution output here for every sentence, right? And then you do this max pooling where you take only one value out of it. So no matter how many values come out of your convolution, you take only the, the maximum value. And if your sentence is 20, 20 uh, words long or 100 words long, you always get just one thing out of it. So can you use this in, in any meaningful way to actually parse text with no <coughs> punctuation marks to determine where the length of the sentence would be most proper? Um, but I think uh, using this technique, you don't need to deal with any length. Um, but, but could you? So if I gave you unformative text or unpunctuated text, could you decide where the period or the question mark or anything else should go? Uh, why would I do that? Why would I set 
of yeah, punctuation somewhere. Because uh, other than NLP, which is, of course, wonderful and beautiful, there's other applications. I agree. <laughs> yeah, so um, what, what you can do in that, uh, in that problem, you can, you can decide on a fixed length on your input and pad it with zeros, for example, at the borders. So if you want to have a fixed input length, then you, you set it to, let's say, 50, 50 words. And if you have only 10, you, you dull out the, the residual. Well, I need to tell me what is the, the input length I should be looking at. So what would be the meaningful part of the sequence of letters or sequence of um, words? This is why if you ask if, if this length sequence matters. So is, is, do I understand the question correctly that it means um, in which part of the sentence is the important information you want to capture? Is the period. Where, where's the period? Where is the period? Where is the question mark? Where is the comma? Well, you, you search for comma and period. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. I, I, unfortunately, I don't understand your question. Um, maybe we can uh, talk later. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So two more questions. Well, um, I uh, observed the, uh, the state of the art, the performance on the sentiment analysis, roughly like 65 percent. So, uh, the champion, the champion why they're using sample line. Yeah. So, uh, uh, can you tell me exactly, uh, specifically, what kind of uh, example they have? Uh, I don't quite remember. It was at least one SVM and some linear regression model, I think, uh, with four different types of models. So is there a competition or something? Um, yes, this is exactly from the so-called SEMEVAL. Have you heard about that? SEMEVAL. It's, it's, uh, it's a workshop on semantic evaluation tasks. For example, one subtask of that is for polarity classification of Twitter text. All right, so data is about the Twitter. Yes. But they have other tasks as well. I think they have also a named entity recognition task. Yours, someone? So last question from Greg. When you're making the word vector, that, that is obvious that you don't need labeling for that. But when you're dealing with emotions, how how can you solve the without labeling, without the network knowing the label in the first place? Yeah. So um, when we come up with when we compute. Um, when we compute the word representation, we do not care about uh, polarity. Okay. This is just a general form of training word representations. We do, don't have any more information than this piece of text. The, the information comes in when, when we tra uh, train this convolution in neural network because this is a supervised classification. We have training data here. Okay?